Hello friends, we are Paulina Ivanishin and Tatiana Hajduk. Today, Kyiv Not Kyiv enjoys the company of Dame Melinda Simmons, uh, Ambassador of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to Ukraine. Welcome. Thank you. Dame Melinda, you've been awarded the Damehood some short time ago, including for the outstanding work you do here in Ukraine. How does it feel to receive such a special honor? So exciting. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary thing because it's a uh, it's a special honour that people from all walks of life in the UK get, but one that a damehood, I certainly hadn't ever thought that would be something that I would get. So uh, I was incredibly surprised when um, I was told. I actually thought that uh, the permanent secretary who called to tell me was going to talk about something completely different. So I was completely surprised and uh, really happy. And I felt the honour for myself, and that felt great to be recognized, of course, but I also felt it for Ukraine. I mean, I'm given this award, you know, for a history of work, but I'm primarily being given it now because of the government's desire to show, to use this tool of the honors system to show support for Ukraine. That's why when you look at the list, it's not just me that's been recognized for work in Ukraine, but there are quite a few people in government and in civil society who are listed for having done humanitarian or political work in Ukraine, who have also received honours. And that too is exciting. We are now in Kyiv, and it's very too scary to say we are used to the air alerts, to the bombings, to the wartime. So how has your life in Kyiv changed during the, the, the last year, and how does the war affect your uh, daily routine? Mm. Uh, in every way, really, because um, before the war, I was, I was an ambassador leading an embassy in regular, regular work. And since the invasion, and particularly since I returned to Kiev, I'm an ambassador leading an embassy through war. And it's an ally country that I represent that is doing everything possible to help Ukraine defend itself. That means every part of our embassy effort, it doesn't matter whether it's commercial or it's political or it's military, humanitarian, economic, we are all of us working around one objective, which is to help Ukraine fight Russia back to its borders. And so that means that the job I thought I had when I first arrived is not the job I'm doing now. How does it affect me? Well, I think when you're leading an embassy through a war, it's, uh, it's not a job, actually. It's a life. It's a life because you're living the effects of the war. You talk about air raid sirens. I live with those sirens. I've got a shelter down in the basement. I've spent time in that shelter. I've leapt from my bed first thing in the morning, hearing explosions, and I've dressed and run, etc., like everyone in Kiev has had to do. But actually, the bigger way in which you feel this to be a life is that everyone around you is also living and dealing with the war. So you experience this as a Monday to Sunday, 24-7 experience. That, I think, has been the biggest change. I was always busy before the war. I was always an active person in this job, but I think even that has no, has very little relationship with the way in which I'm working now. When we, we arrived in the embassy, you were going for a walk outside. Are you still enjoying uh, Kiev even during the wartime? Yes, of course. Do you know, uh, there's a part of me that thinks that, of course, Kiev is liberated, right? It's a liberated city um, since Russia tried to come in and failed to come in. So I think of it as, a privilege, almost a duty actually, to be um, showing friends and colleagues in the UK that it's possible to do this, that you can walk in the most beautiful weather, that there are cafes open, that there are even new cafes opening um, during wartime, that there is food that you can buy, friends that you can see, the river that you can walk by. I think it's really important to show people that there is this, um, that's what liberation can feel like in Ukraine, the ability to do things and to show and help people outside Ukraine understand that the whole of Ukraine is not war-torn. But I also think it's a really important form of defiance. It's a really important signal to Russians too, that Ukrainians, and I play my part in this, are determined that they can live their lives and work their jobs and grow their businesses and celebrate being in their capital city. It's a defiance. So I play my part in that defiance. 
On February 8th, President Zelensky visited London. So did you, right? Yeah, I went too. <laughs> of course. That was uh, the second overseas visit that President uh, paid to a foreign country. Yeah. It was Great Britain that shows how important our relations are to us. Great Britain has always been a very bold uh, supporter uh, of, um, of a geopolitical perspective for Ukraine. You support it. European perspective for Ukraine when you were the part of the EU. Yeah. You now support the Euro-Atlantic perspective for Ukraine. Uh, it is clear that NATO demands consensus, but is Great Britain ready to actively promote Ukraine's accession to NATO once the war is over and we win? And uh, was this a topic uh, of a conversation between the two leaders of our countries uh, in London? Well, uh, I mean, our position on uh, Ukraine's desire to be part of NATO hasn't changed. We've made clear that we support that accession. There are things that Ukraine, before the war, needed to do, and we've always been really clear with our Ukrainian partners what those things are, and those things don't change, actually. Institutional reform as well as NATO uh, operational capability. But what the invasion has done is it's accelerated that NATO capability. It's also demonstrated uh, Ukraine's both willingness and ability to learn fast to operate at that level. So um, uh, the day of uh, conversations between Zelensky and his team, President Zelensky and his team, and uh, the Prime Minister was more immediately about what to do in this next six months to help um, capitalize on the advantage that Ukraine currently has on the battlefield. But separately, given that NATO summit is coming up, etc., that political work continues. It's never actually stopped. So in that sense, nothing changes our perspective and nothing changes the work that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Uh, we know that one of the topics during the meeting in London was uh, the defense cooperation and the United Kingdom is uh, the, the leading uh, ally in this aspect. Uh, we see uh, the proofs uh, like uh, the Harpoon anti-ship missiles, the Challenger tanks, uh, the Seeking helicopters, now Ukraine needs wings. And we have seen some positive signals. Uh, so should we expect uh, any wings like jets soon? So I think, first of all, that the way in which the UK has helped Ukraine is by being receptive to what Ukrainians have said they need at each kind of stage, if you like, of the fighting. Everything that we've sent, when you look back over what we've sent and when we've sent it, has been about what it's been perceived as needed for the um, challenge that faces Ukraine at each time. When um, the Prime Minister spoke with President Zelensky, what was interesting was uh, and they were really clear about it in their press statements. They were talking about how to capitalize on the fact that Russia at this time appears to have lost its advantage and therefore there is a window of opportunity for Ukraine not just to defend itself, but to push, push right back. So then the conversation about what weaponry you need becomes what does it take uh, to do that. I think that uh, it's really positive, it's certainly positive that countries are beginning to commit to provide tanks Tanks are what is needed right now. The issue with jets is that there isn't so much an availability issue as a capability issue. Those jets are not things that you can just get into and fly off. You have to learn how to use them. And those types of jets that Ukraine is asking for are not ones which uh, the Air Force traditionally has used. So they have got to be trained to use them right. So that's why um, when uh, President Zelensky was in London, the Prime Minister announced that we would extend our military training both to maritime and also to Air Force. So that pilot training is starting because it needs to be completed before you can start using those jets. And I know this is a hard message for people to hear, but that is not training that you can shortcut and it will take time. For that reason, my expectation is that the uh, increasing the capability of, uh, of Air Force through whichever provision of jets is going to be as much about securing Ukraine's long-term future as it may be about pushing Russia back now. It has to be seen as both a medium and long-term project as it might be about what you need right now. It's just the reality uh, of the complex nature of that kit. The decision to hand over Challenger tanks and especially the speed uh, with which it was taken stood in stark contrast with the process that preceded uh, Germany's consent to hand over the leap parts. What makes Britons act more boldly than their European colleagues in matters of arms supplies? 
Well, I can't speak for other countries. I'm not going to try. Every country has its own culture as well as its own history and its own political um, stance. But I think what I'm very proud of about the UK is that we have been consistent in our understanding of what's happening here, consistent in our view of it. UK doesn't like seeing a nuclear P5 bully country invade uh, another country with no uh, other reason than to subjugate it. It's contrary to the values that Ukraine and UK share. And as it turns out, the UK feels really strongly about those values, strongly enough to feel that uh, it makes it not just Ukraine's fight, but all our fight. And that has dictated our decisions to give all of our, all of the types of support, whether it's generators or tents or, you know, tariff-free trade access, which of course is another way in which we've been um, helping, or military equipment, it's all founded on this. It's a really, really important message, not just for Russia, but any other country that's contemplating some form of subjugation uh, based on breaking apart the rules-based international system. These values are things the UK has invested in, feel strongly about, for our security and for European security. So this has been a consistent theme all the way through. But there's something else here which I think is different and which really surprised and moved me. We landed at an airport last week, which is about 45 minutes away from London. Nobody knew for security reasons, right? Until President Zelensky landed. And then, of course, uh, it was communicated. In the 45 minutes that it took for the car to go from the aeroplane to central London, people had gathered just regular people had gathered and some of them had Ukrainian flags and some of them were just showing a flag on their phone uh, and they were clapping and they were waving and they were cheering and I really can't remember the last time I've been so moved. I mean, UK is not a country where people are told to come out on the streets and show, you know, show their support. It was completely spontaneous. So uh, I took away something which I hear about from Kiev but I don't often get a chance to see it. It isn't just a policy that is about values. It's also something that British people really feel in their heart. Nothing else brings you to the streets to wave and see if you can see President Zelensky than a gut instinct that this is a support that everybody buys into. It was a really proud moment. We appreciate this support so much in Ukraine. Um, back to the weapons. Uh, the reluctance of some of the Western allies uh, is uh, sometimes accompanied with the thesis that uh, uh, if we give more weapons to Ukraine, this will probably escalate uh, the, the, the war course and uh, uh, push Putin, for example, to do something uh, more, uh, I don't know, some, something more. Yeah. Uh, don't you think that we leave the right uh, of the initiative to the aggressor in this case? Mm. Do you know, there's a, there's a part of me that thinks we're, we are collectively beyond the point of worrying about escalation. I mean, the, the threats have been coming all the way through since, you know, since the beginning, frankly, and certainly since Putin saw that we were inclined as allied countries to help Ukraine militarily. He's been making these threats. And it's hard to see where they've actually materialized since we have been stepping up and giving exactly the sort of kit that he has been specifically saying, if you do this, this is going to happen, and then this hasn't happened. So I think there probably is a growing and quite healthy scepticism among countries about that threat, which doesn't mean you don't take it seriously, but that perhaps it's being um, considered as less of a percentage in the equation of, of what you give. As for the UK, the Prime Minister made clear that nothing is off the table. We don't make our calculations about how we help Ukraine based on what Putin might do. We make our calculations on what helped to give Ukraine based on what the Ukrainians ask for and our joint understanding of what is happening uh, in terms of the invasion and nothing else plays a part in that decision. Continuing the topic that nothing is off the table, uh, the liberation of the entire territory of Ukraine is a matter of successful counteroffensive, yes. which means that we need weapons, not only defensive ones, but also an offensive. And we see a lot of signals and actions that um, show that Britain is open to uh, granting Ukraine with some longer range missiles or, or, and, and the weapon of this type. My question is, are there any red lines that Britain will not cross in its involvement in Russia's war against Ukraine, being at the same time Ukraine's most uh, loyal ally? Well, bearing in mind the fact that everything that Ukraine wants, the UK may not, may not necessarily have, right? Which is why 
Ramstein, for example, is so important because it has to be a communal conversation where you understand the need and then you work out who's got it uh, and who can get it to Ukraine most quickly. So we play our part in that conversation as well as playing our part in what we have that we can make available. Uh, with that as context, I refer you back to my previous answer. This isn't a question about red lines. It's a question about what the need is. So the thing uh, that guides it is the frank conversation that is had between Ukrainian and British and other ally officials about what is going on um, in the evasion so that we can make the right judgments uh, about what's needed at what time. It's not about how far we're prepared to go. That's good to hear. In 2020, the United Kingdom and Ukraine signed the Strategic Partnership Agreement and planned to increase the Ukraine's military presence in the Black Sea. Now the situation has changed completely. Russia is occupying the Black Sea. Uh, but uh, our question is, is there anything else from the old plans that remains relevant? And if so, what, what is the, the perception of this in the UK? Well, it's all relevant. It hasn't changed at all in its relevance. Um, it's all as important. And it was about, actually, the naval part was about building the capacity of the Navy. Um, and uh, all of that work continues. But of course, some of it just isn't possible to continue because of the way the, uh, the invasion is, uh, is progressing. But the conversations about the need, those continue. So like everything else, actually, the, the naval capacity building deal continues where it can. And the conversations with the commercial providers continue. Um, but maybe some parts of it have to wait uh, until liberation in one area or another makes it possible. But the aspiration that was signed up to, the agreements that were signed, remain as valid now as they were in 2020. Some time ago, um, one of the most difficult questions in the bilateral relations was visa policy of the, of the United Kingdom towards Ukrainians. I know, it's still difficult. It's still difficult, yeah, but now uh, thousands of Ukrainians are in the UK, my family with the kids are also in the UK, and uh, the, the, the British people gave some shelter to, 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 the, to the Ukrainians. Don't you think that this will somehow influence the visa policy restrictions of the United Kingdom towards Ukrainians? Well, it certainly influenced visa availability during the invasion because, as you, I'm sure you know, there are two visa schemes that didn't exist before that were created under the previous Home Secretary, which uh, have seen visas issued to something like 200, and I think it's up to about 17,000, 217,000 visas issued under those two um, schemes. And uh, that's, again, another proud thing, really, that UK has been uh, open to making it possible for Ukrainians to come and live and work and for their kids to go to school in safety in the UK. If you're asking me whether the uh, invasion affects in any way the uh, question of visa-free, I would say that uh, I think it's unlikely, but that in any case, it's just not a time to comment on it because it's not where we're at. Where we're at at the moment is humanitarian help, is enabling people to go somewhere safely and actually enabling a, vi a viable visa distribution system, which in the first part of last year, most of last year, wasn't even possible when most people had left Kiev. So that is where we're at at the moment. Um, in the question of the future relationship, this is something I suspect you'll be asking my successor. It's very uh, pleasant to note that relations between the UK and the Ukraine are built not only on common national interests, but on the true friendship. That's a super question. Mm. Uh, Boris Johnson is called nothing else but sincere friend of Ukraine here. With the arrival of Rishi Sunak in the office, nothing changed in this yeah. friendly ties on the highest governmental level. Um, relations built on trust exist between um, defense ministers, Dan Wallace and Alexei Reznikov, and people close to negotiations say that it makes a lot easier to reach agreements uh, about sensitive issues of defense cooperation uh, what manifestations of a personal, humanly sympathy at the uh, highest uh, level between the, uh, the officials of our two countries did you witness? Maybe you have some good story for us. At the highest level? Mm -hmm. I mean, th those I think have been quite public, actually. You, you've alluded to them. You know, the, the airport that we landed at last week was a, a regional airport. It was not in London. But our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, came all the way to that airport to meet President Zelensky off the plane. That's a personal statement. That's a personal thing to do. And he came down out of that massive RAF transporter and they hugged. It was a really lovely moment, a quite spontaneous moment. And you're right, it's, it's, 
it must be a relief to Ukrainians, but it's also fantastic to see that that warmth endures, right? That it, it, it's personal, of course, it was personal for Boris Johnson, but it was also quite natural um, for Rishi Sunak. So uh, at, at the highest level, I think you see it all the time. James Cleverly, our foreign secretary, has a very similar relationship of warmth with um, Foreign Minister Kuleba. Um, so, you know, at the highest level, I think you see it at every meeting. I think where it's more extraordinary is um, seeing it on the street. For myself, um, you know, I can't walk a block now without being stopped by people who say thank you. I go and buy a coffee and someone says, here's your coffee and thank you for all you're doing for our country. Or, you know, I go and get my teeth cleaned and the dentist says, thank you for all you're doing. It's really very lovely. But um, I was in Odessa for the grain deal um, discussions with other G7 ambassadors. We were standing at the port, kind of waiting, I think, for Minister Kubrikov to deliver a speech. And there was a line of Ukrainian troops who were uh, standing at the back. And one of them broke rank. He came out of the line and came over to me and he took his badge off the side of his, of his sleeve and gave it to me. And he said he wanted me to have this as a thank you because his wife had gone to the UK and the UK had taken her in and he was grateful. And I was, I was unable to say anything for the rest of the afternoon. I was so unbelievably moved. I really was. It, that was several months ago now. And I still remember it as one of the most extraordinary Moment. So the thing about your question is, it's very important for Ukrainians to see and feel that warmth at the highest level. But the truth is that when you see a natural expression of it among people who don't have any business with each other, I didn't know that man, uh, or these people who were lining the streets, I don't know who those people were. They're just people who wanted to show that natural uh, warmth that you talk about runs through every level. And you have to remember that when politicians see that, when prime ministers see that, they also see that their mandate is backed up by that significant public support. President Zelensky sees it from his people and Rishi Sunak sees it from his. It's incredibly powerful. Sorry, did I just make you cry? I didn't mean yes, to do that. a little bit. That it's was a such a wonderful story that my eyes are now wet, but I'm okay. I'm no, okay. Thank not you too. very much for sharing it. It's very touching. It's, it's really very touching. Uh, uh, the Ukrainian army is uh, becoming more feminine. Uh, over the fa past five years, uh, the uh, number of women in the army has almost doubled to 40,000 and now women uh, can not only take the places of uh, uh, telephone operators or cooks, they can be the combat leaders, so the, the army is progressing and uh, the gender agenda in the army is progressing. However, the perception of um, uh, the female uh, mandatory mobilization in Ukraine is still very controversial. Mm -hmm. What is your point of view towards this topic? Well, I'm not going to dictate to Ukrainians what they think they need in order to, to fight. So I don't have a position on mandatory mobilization, gender-based or any other way. A country has to decide for itself what people resource it needs and where they need them to fight. I suppose what I can say about the focus on women is that, um, do you know, I remember before the war, my last engagement with, with the armed forces over the participation of women was an argument with the previous defense minister over a parade in which women had to wear high heels. I was so disgusted. Uh, I was quite loud about it. I was loud on social media, and then I uh, spoke with him about it. And uh, not soon after that, they were given boots that had a bit of a heel, but not a high heel, and I thought that was a really big, uh, that was a really big win. But now, when you look at how uh, women are doing what they're doing at, at every level, really in every part uh, of society, not just fighting, but also keeping communities together. I've visited now several communities where school bomb shelters are being built and windows are being put back in. And I see women of all ages doing that work, of all ages. Grandmothers are, are, are there helping put cement on the walls and you know, young people in their 20s, women who are volunteering to try to make their communities safe. What I really, what I, I really hope for this country is that the, this, the obvious way in which you can see what women are doing here what you're doing by reporting uh, on, on situations, by speaking to me and others during this war, it finally penetrates the consciousness of what is a very male-dominated economy in Ukraine and a very patriarchal society that Ukraine could speed its way to success 
if 100% of its country was empowered to participate in that and not just 50%. You know, Ukraine has no limits if women are unable to do what we now know, what we always knew they could do. Yeah, and that was actually my next question. So the role of women not only in army has changed, but in business, in politics, yeah. in the families. Because um, men went to territorial defense units at the start of the war. Uh, many of them joined army as well as women. But the role of women, even in the family, uh, is now absolutely another thing. Mm -hmm. So the women ha have to take care of their kids. Uh, there were a lot of stories when a woman uh, takes a car and drives 4,000 kilometers yeah. to evacuate children, and then all the decisions uh, regarding their future are on her. So it, it changes a lot, and really this, this patriarchy is going somewhere. Yes. Somewhere. Yeah, it good does. For good. Yeah, absolutely. Ukrainians value the support of the British people so much that sometimes it takes the very unexpected form. Uh, the Kyiv bakery in Zavartailo uh, made a cake, you remember? Uh, I they, went there, <laughs> yeah. I tried it. It was delicious. It was delicious. <laughs> so uh, for those who don't know, the Ukrainian uh, bakery in Zavartailo is making cakes uh, and they name it after the British Prime Minister, adding the um, Ukrainian endings like the Boris Johnson new cake. Did you like mm -hmm. it? Uh, that was the one that I tried. It was really good. I tried it in the summer. So we, we'll make sure that you will try Rishi Sinan because we yeah. had so I haven't for yet tried you. it. There's a Liz Truss one as well, which is purple. Here it is. Okay, sure. <laughs> I hope you will like it. <laughs> this is uh, Rishi Sunakovic. Rishi Sunakovic. Okay. So I definitely yeah. have to try it. They look delicious. <laughs> they look very calorific. So I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, um, Thank you as we enjoyed this conversation. Madam thank Ambassador, you. Thank you very much for doing an outstanding job. Thank you for your time, for your efforts. Thank you for spending your morning with us. Thank you. And I thank you both for your bravery. You should remember that you're both brave people doing your jobs at this time here. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's Everyone in Ukraine, Ukraine now who is currently in Ukraine is brave. And everyone, everyone around brave. the world who is supporting us is yeah. also brave. I agree. I agree with that. Thank you very much for staying with us. This was uh, Dame Melinda Simmons, uh, Ambassador of uh, uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland to Ukraine. And this were Pauline Ivanishin and Tatiana Haiduk. Thank you very much. Stand with Ukraine. See you soon.